All right, everybody. Welcome to today's Dapper Community Call, number 98, um, February 7th, 2024. Uh, my name is Cecil Phillip. I'm going to be your host today. I am one of your Dapper Community Managers. So happy for you all to join us today. We have a lot of fun stuff that we're going to talk about. So really quick. Um, so first, we're going to have Mark Capito um, coming in from Watts. He's going to be talking to us about how Dapper enabled lightning speed development at his company. So that's going to be a great conversation. Um, then we also have David and Philip from Microsoft here. That's going to talk to us a little bit about Dapper and .NET Expire. Then, you know, we're running to like the community show and tell. And at the end, as always, we'll have a little bit of open discussion. Um, you know, as you have questions, feel free to go ahead and drop the questions in the chat. Uh, I'm going to try and mute everyone while our speakers are speaking so that, you know, we don't have too many distractions. But again, if you have questions after each section, we are going to have a moment where you can ask our presenters questions and things of that nature. So with that being said, uh, Mark, why don't you go ahead, um, share your screen. I'm going to stop sharing mine. You can share and then you could, uh, you could take it from here. Thanks, Cecil. Okay, perfect. Crystal clear. Great. Okay. Well, hey everyone. Uh, excited to to share a little bit about our journey uh, leveraging Dapper here at Watts uh, Water Technologies. Um, you can see enabled lightning speed. Maybe a stretch, maybe not. Uh, I'll let you all be the judge. Um, so, just a quick intro slide. I've been working at Watts Water Technologies for two years. Uh, we're me and, and the rest of my team are working in the Watts digital arm of Watts Water Technologies. It's a global company, so quite large, uh, but we're basically responsible for the cloud and the web and the, um, you know, the user layer and the cloud layer of all of our applications, uh, while the business units, and I'll get a little bit more into this, uh, are responsible for the manufacturing and the uh, smarts and the devices that we manufacture. Um, been uh, been working on distributed applications, both hybrid and cloud native, for uh, a little over twelve years. Uh, I love React. I love .NET. Uh, been using Azure uh, for twelve years as well. So love Azure and uh, Dapper enthusiast. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, here we go. So a little bit more about the company uh, that we that we work for and that we're building a solution for. Uh, we build water quality solutions, uh, but Watts is actually a family of brands. Uh, and this gets a little bit more into the delineation between what Watts is and Watts Digital is, excuse me, and the rest of what the company is responsible for. So everything that we're doing is very much in the IoT space, uh, all for water uh, solutions. So whether you're in a hotel and you hope that you have hot water uh, for your shower, or you hope that, uh, you know, you're using the restroom and the water and the water flushes uh, correctly. So all of those things are uh, more than likely uh, things that Watts has manufactured or has a place in that space. So the company as a whole has been on a journey the last five or so years to make uh, our equipment slash sensors smart and connected, hence the IoT uh, nod. And then we've we've recently kind of used some of those last five years uh, to, to, to really focus in and develop a commercial strategy on how, what we actually want to be building um, and what how we want to be presenting this type of information to users, which is a very complex problem to be solving. So the platform is, is about a year old. Uh, here's our solution. It is, uh, I cannot give away the name, unfortunately, because it's it's going to be launching here in a couple months, but these are a couple quick snapshots about what we're building. And this is all helpful context, I'm hoping for the pre actual um, details on some of the lessons that we've learned building solutions in the past and where we're headed. So we're building a solution that gives customers uh, and users, uh, it, it, part of it will be a free platform, uh, visual, uh, and remote management capabilities into their plumbing system. So here you can see a real-time equipment dashboard, uh, the actual unit of it itself, uh, some of the important metrics that are coming off of the device. And, and this is new for Watts. So you cannot today remotely control that many things that Watts actually manufactures. You also uh, can't connect to many of those things. So this is a huge step 
forward for Watts and, and really we're trying to bring uh, value from that remote visibility and, and paint a larger picture together of their mechanical room, which is more so the image on the right, where we're bringing readings and real-time telemetry from all over the the, the, the company's uh, property, so or the customer's property, excuse me. So it could be a hotel, it could be uh, McCormick Place where KubeCon was in Chicago, uh, it, it could be a number of places. So we really have this real-time digital twin representation of a customer's mechanical room and the water flowing through that mechanical room. You know, you can think of hospitality and um, healthcare industries. This is extremely com important component of their business. You don't want to have a Legionella risk. You don't want to have guests complaining. You know, all of the information that we've gathered uh, on the healthcare industry is, is shown just the near neighbor um, uh, bad image uh, that a that a poor experience, one poor experience for a guest staying in a hotel, how that can affect and impact their business um, in unfortunate ways. So that's a little bit about the product, a little bit about the company. Now let's dive into some of the details here on on Dapper versus what we were kind of using prior to Dapper. So we had a solution that we are that we are fully replacing. It was built on Kubernetes. Uh, use Docker Compose, but then it had this kind of tool sprawl, if you will. And, and uh, I want to talk a little bit more about some of those, uh, each, each of these components, if you will, uh, in these boxes. So PubSub, there was actually something, a solution, if you will, for, for a distributed system to you know, publish events and subscribe to those events at scale. It's called mass transit, but it was a .NET focused solution. And when I think wholeheartedly about what the platform needs, we may have something operating in Python. We may have something operating in Java or Golang. We may, we may want to go outside of the boundaries of, of our immediate you know, framework that we, that we know and love, but there's use cases for everything. So um, using, uh, using Mass Transit had some, some benefits to the use cases that we had back two or three years ago, but since Dapper came along, we've noticed that it's, it's extremely accelerated our ability to pub, publish events and then subscribe to those events uh, downstream. And also the opt-in model is an amazing benefit. Um, if you can imagine, we have telemetry coming in, we have thousands of events uh, in in relatively close time, so we there's very much a lot of burst processing that's going on there, and we rely on PubSub as a huge component of our applications to be able to show near real time or real time as possible telemetry um, alerts, and I'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. But just holistically, the PubSub model is a huge backbone of our architecture and moving away from being a, a .NET ecosystem focused solution uh, into something a little bit more in ger generic that's plug and play and platform slash vendor agnostic is a huge, huge advantage to our applications today. So we could swap out, you know, service bus, we could swap out event grid, we could swap out Redis, we could, we could do anything um, now that we have Dapper. Uh, jumping over to, to cron jobs, uh, in in the .NET ecosystem specifically, there's a couple you know big bang solutions for uh, cron jobs. Azure Functions, which are amazing, they allow you to. It, I don't, it almost couldn't be easier to spin up a cron job using Azure Functions um, or Quartz or there's Hangfire. There's a couple .NET focused solutions uh, that have a little bit of overhead or context switching cost associated with them. Quartz, if I Googled Quartz right now, you have to literally type code that configures the jobs and when you want it to run and this, and then you have to deploy that scheduler and you have to host it and, you know, you see where I'm going. So having literally a cron binding that can hit an API or, or perform some action or a workflow uh, is a huge enabler as well. We, we When we talk about just perfectly fitting into our use cases. We have things that run on cron timers all the time. Uh, you can think of outbox patterns or other things. So cron, uh, cron binding is amazing 
enabler for us and fit right into our use cases. Uh, also, all the work and hands uh, hands on coding that we didn't have to do to deploy an Azure function uh, just for this just for a similar or simple use case, excuse me, and the the time that we saved not learning the courts scheduler API, uh, all of that time is spent developing features that differentiate our application. Uh, so amazing and ena enabler there. Service to service communications, uh, not at Watts, but in my past life, this was something that was, that was a nightmare. We had to uh, inform other development teams, hey, we're developing a new service. Uh, it's gonna do X, Y, and Z. Here's the new URL per environment, and then they had to then go and update their their you know app configs or app settings, if you will. And uh, then it was like, okay, well, how are we going to be securing these API or, or service invocations uh, requests? And uh, also, don't forget about resiliency. So every application probably had their own flavor on what they were handling using Poly for retries or, or error handling. And uh, it just, it just, it works, but it could be simpler. And so simpler, when I think of simpler, I think of Dapper and I think of how simple it is to make a service to service call that's that's secure, that has resiliency um, and, and it couldn't be easier. So uh, amazing, amazing uh, service to service communication and functionality offered by Dapper compared to what we were using. And then finally, the last thing I'll highlight here is State Store. Um, you know, no, no longer do we have to have Redis SDKs or Cosmos DB SDKs or any other type of SDKs in our code and, and you know, rely on those SDK specific APIs. We replace all of, the, all of those SDKs with a simple Dapper SDK. And some of the, uh, some of the APIs that it ships with we're able to satisfy our our needs, and it's just it's been an amazing accelerator from you know pulling in different package NuGet packages or or packages in general, needing to learn those specific APIs. Also, have to learn the specific APIs for the things behind the scenes. So, are you using Azure Premium? Are you using or sorry, are you using Redis Premium? Are you using the standard tier, etc.? Um, it's just been ex extremely simplified. Uh, switching to Dapper. Uh, that so, looking at at the prior slide here, all the things on the left side, those are the those are the lessons learned, and we felt like there was a better way when it came time for us to write a brand new solution, which doesn't happen that often. Um, but it was an amazing opportunity here. So, a couple of things that we wanted to just keep in mind is is developers should be focused on building differentiating features of our applications, uh, not learning, you know, not spending time uh, learning Kubernetes or, or deploying things to the cloud or, 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 you know, worrying about the different SDKs and keeping up with those versions, et cetera. Uh, we needed to accelerate our time to production. We had, um, we have a very small development team at Watts that are actually Watts employees, and we outsource um, our, the rest. We augment the rest of our software engineering teams. So time to production and time to getting features in customers' hands and getting um, just getting our our feet under us was a was a huge um, was a huge milestone, I, I'd say, for us to launch this product. We had a beta customer. They were very patient, but they were very much willing to uh, to, to be a beta tester. And they helped us course correct many time, many different features and, and uh, function features and uh, capabilities that our platform has today. And uh, getting those new features to the customer is is at the heart of everything that we want to do. That's why we're here. That's why we're writing the code. So we we needed to accelerate the time that it took to to write a feature and get it to production. Uh, we needed something that felt familiar. Uh, we didn't want to, you know, have a whole bunch of tool sprawl or make it very difficult to have. And I and I have this below. Uh, you know, the dev the dev experience had to be had to be nice. And 
it couldn't be nicer than when you go to uh, the the Dapper documentation, and it's extremely clear. You can get up, uh, you can get up and uh, up and running here, and uh, in probably less than an hour, I'd say, maybe even less than than fifteen minutes, if you're already familiar with some of the other technologies. So, um, we needed something that felt familiar and that had a great developer experience. We also wanted optionality for languages and frameworks. So we didn't want to. Yes, we love .NET, but and yes, we love Azure, but there may be use cases where we want to integrate with some other things uh, and use some other frameworks or languages. So kind of how we start, how we stumbled upon Dapper is we also were trying to move as fast as possible. Uh, Kubernetes has a little bit of overhead uh, associated with it that I would argue. We found Azure container apps uh, and we were able to deploy something very quickly, uh, we were able to have two container apps talking to each other, I'd also say very quickly, and it came with some of the things built in that we didn't we didn't really need to care about at the time when we were trying to get to production. It had built in um, auto scaling, built in orchestration, uh, built in VNet, and then plug and play Dapper configuration, all accessible from the Azure portal as well, which is which is nice, I would argue. Uh, local development. So you can't ship code if you can't understand what you're and test what you're writing. So we we love Thai, uh, Project Thai, which could potentially be uh, setting up the next presenters perfectly um, for .NET Aspire. But right now we're using uh, Thai. It allows us to spin up our, our .NET uh, services. And uh, we have a beautiful opt-in model here with a Thai uh, YAML file, and you pair that with the extensions that they have down here for Dapper. It doesn't get more. It, it doesn't get much simpler than that for local development. It it, it all you have to do is you know a, a tie run, and then it spins up everything based off of this config file, and poof, you can see over on the right, you've already got your Dapper. Um, you've got your Dapper containers running. You've got your microservice containers running, and it it couldn't be easier. So, uh, love tie. Uh, that's what we're that's what we're working with with local development, and we found that it has extremely uh, streamlined our ability to debug one or more services at a time. Uh, jumping just a layer deeper is one of the biggest use cases for app for 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 Dapper and how it fits into our application is telemetry processing. So I have kind of two views back to back here. One is this view where it's more of a workflow view. So you can imagine telemetry coming into our application and kind of permeating the different types of services or activities, if you will, and what we need to do with that data. We need to, uh, we, we, use, we use PubSub all over the place. We use State Store. Uh, we use uh, bindings. We use a service invocation. So we use many different building blocks out of the box that Dapper gives us for this process. So we have uh, telemetry coming in from one or more types of equipment or sensors that is being evaluated based on what the customer chooses to care about. So when, when we're stepping into this evaluate telemetry activity, it's really evaluating, hey, uh, am I at a risk for Legionella? Am I exceeding a, a, a pressure threshold that could damage a customer's pipes, ultimately causing a leak? Is it a leak? Um, then through that evaluation, alerts get created and alerts are sent via the proper channels, uh, Twilio, SendGrid, SignalR, a couple others. So um, that is one flow of the telemetry. And from a workflow perspective, you can just see how easy this is to plug and play. Um, it, it's extremely simple to evaluate and realize our use cases for telemetry flowing all through the application. The other path here is, is kind of distributing telemetry so that we have a local copy in some of the other areas of the application. You saw the dashboard. Um, the dashboard is kind of the other uh, area where we need to have this local telemetry um, or, or telemetry, uh, the latest readings kind of cached here so that we can present the information in a very uh, quick manner to our users. Then from there, the, all, the, the system app view, and I'll scroll back up here. This view is as real time as we could possibly get it. Uh, from the moment that our telemetry hits our, hits our API or our backend, 
it's it's presented to the user uh, within seconds. So all of these all of these things are happening very very quickly, but they also have completely separate flows. So um, te telemetry processing really is a massive workflow and a key part of our system that is is extremely easy to build with Dapper. I could I argue I could probably build a, a workflow by the time the second session starts and ends uh, here just with Dapper. It, it's that easy. Uh, kind of looking at the alternate flow here is is just all all of the different areas that you could see that Dapper has plug and play components. You've got the output bindings with with Twilio, SendGrid, etc. Um, you've got the uh, hub sub. Uh, you've got the pub sub different pub sub components here. Um, we're actually using event grid for this telemetry in ingestion, and then we're using service bus for the others. It doesn't matter to our application, right? All our application cares about is, is there event received or do I need to publish an event and who are the subscribers for the event? And those are, they're interchangeable, um, excuse me, they're interchangeable and our application doesn't need to care if it's service bus or event hub or, or Redis. And that is extremely powerful, especially when we think about just chaining workflows together or needing to have a continuous, um, continuously publishing and subscribing model where, the, where we're chaining activities in this type of manner. So the state store is also another thing that I wanna highlight here where we have a couple different sources of truth for different things that we're showing on the system app over here. We've got, we've got names and locations that may come from one area. We've got device readings and, and alerts that may come from the equipment themselves. Uh, we've got alerts that come from the application. We have to marry all of that data somewhere. And the state store is, uh, is an amazing uh, leverageable tool or, or our component of our architecture for that. So. This uh, having these components just be building blocks of our applications doesn't matter if we're using Redis, doesn't matter if we're using Cosmos DB for the state store. It is the state store, uh, and that's all our application needs to care about. Not not the underlying SDKs. Not that this is Event Grid or Event Hubs or something else. Uh, it's just the pub sub model, and and that's the component. So. That's a high level view uh, in a specific use case view of kind of our architecture and how it's how it's leveraging Dapper today in production and has been for over a year. And uh, kind of the final thing here is, is Dapper is the catapult that we needed. Uh, I, I mentioned not needing to write schedulers or, or things for, for simple cron jobs. That's thousands of lines of code potentially that we didn't have to write. So we're able to focus on the features, again, that differentiate our application because security, uh, distributed tracing, resiliency are available out of the box with Dapper. Uh, Dapper's component model makes development in distributed environments plug and play. Uh, as I just highlighted, it didn't matter that we're using service bus for some things or event hub for other things. It was just all pub sub. And at the end of the day, that's all our application needs to care about. Uh, a nod to the to the to the Dapper docs. They're great. We didn't uh, expect when we started our journey exploring Dapper and creating a quick POC. We didn't expect to see a reference to Project Tie or some of the other things that we were also exploring. This was all brand new. It all happened within a matter of, I'd argue, two weeks or so that we discovered Dapper and then we found Project Tie because we were already using Docker Compose and, and Kubernetes in our existing application. So. We found tools that worked for us and allowed us to accelerate our development. And that's what we, we stuck with it because we saw kind of the stars aligned here. Um, there's also very little overhead or tooling. You, in, you install Dapper CLI, you saw that tie YAML uh, config file. That's basically, you know, all intents and purposes, that's, that's basically all you need, I'd argue, to get up and running. And so it's, it's extremely simple. That's, that's the power that we're leveraging Dapper for. Uh, a couple other quick nods is vendor agnostic. Love having optionality for languages and frameworks. Uh, you never know what use case is around the corner. And so having that optionality is extremely powerful. And then 
developer experience, kind of a hot topic to these days. Uh, and I think Dapper gets it right. Uh, Dapper reduced uh, many of our SDK sprawl, uh, scattered retry logic, and hard-coded URLs, and, and just so many other things that make developing distributed applications difficult. Uh, Dapper is really allowing us to focus on the features, and Dapper is managing everything else. So uh, that's what I wanted to present today. Any questions or comments? Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. Um, I think we had a question in the chat. Uh, this one came from Tom, and Tom was saying, great presentation. When you replaced mass transit, were you able to just swap in your message brokers like RabbitMQ or Redis? Yeah, or message bus or uh, event hubs, whatever you guys were using. Um, I've used um, mass transit in a past life. And don't get me wrong, I like Chris Patterson and, and, and you know, he's a great guy, um, but I had to code a lot. I, I think I spent two months or three months, whereas in Dapper, I think I spent maybe for the same work, maybe two weeks. <laughs> yes, I, plus one to that. I will say we we got a head start because we started on a green, greenfield application. So we actually weren't replacing in place mass transit, but I could totally uh, relate with what you're saying. Uh, I don't I don't know if there would be another way around it. And to your point, adding another type of subscriber was a is a breeze. Is yeah, it? yeah. No, I was just curious about that. That's great. Yeah, we. <laughs> I I feel for you, and I relate with you, and I agree. Mass transit's great for what it does, but when you're wanting to just be a little bit more agnostic. No, that that company switched to. Um, they're an IoT based company as well. They switched to Dapper. Um, uh, when they built all their uh, microservices in a green field, but, you know, so I, I told them to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, love it. Love all it. right. So next question we got in the chat. Um, did you add cloud events when moving from mass transit to Dapper? Yes, we did. Yes. I love cloud events as well. I uh, love that standardization and yes, we are using them today. And I have a question linked to this. Uh, yeah. So you you add cloud events, but how did you manage the transition from mass transit, which was not using cloud events, and after when you switch to to Dapper with the cloud events? Yeah, great question. We we unfortunately did we we didn't encounter that the need to replace um, the those messaging formats because we were starting with a brand new application. So everything running mass transit, that application still operational today. We were just using mass transit as one of the hub sub mechanisms. And we learned that we got curious, is there a different way to do this at a larger scale? And that let us be a little bit more agnostic. So we didn't replace mass transit to leverage cloud events. We actually, that's still an application you're using mass transit today. Okay, thanks. And, and did you use the cloud events to transport the open telemetry in the message, I imagine? To, to have the trays and the span to continue to see this? We're not using uh, open telemetry today, I think. We're using, okay. uh, we have some things that are still on our roadmap to leverage from, you know, I'd say that from the cloud native ecosystem. We just got up and running with, I think, Siri log or something else. And, and we, we've we just not gotten that on our roadmap yet. Okay, thanks. All right, we're going to take one more question and then we're going to switch over to our uh, next speakers. Um, this question is coming from Mark. So we're, we're doing a Mark to Mark question thing here. Um, are you considering using Kubernetes for running your service? Yes. So we um, we found that in, in, in part of our journey and everybody's journey is a little bit unique. We found that we didn't need uh, the whole path, everything that Kubernetes offered, but also there is a there's some overhead to getting Kubernetes up off the ground in a secure in a secure fashion, and so we had a limited number of DevOps folks that were with us on this project. There was also an NDA around the project, so there was 
we weren't able to let the full DevOps team in to, to assist. So really we had a super lightweight development team working on this that made Azure Container Apps be the go-to just de facto choice. Um, now we're looking at moving to Kubernetes now that we've kind of stabilized and we've hit our cruising altitude, if you will, because we're realizing we need that next layer of visibility into uh, Dapper logs and 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 some of the next uh, some of the APIs that K Kubernetes offers, and uh, just holistically more ownership of some of the things that Azure Container App Azure Container Apps abstracts. So we are planning actively for a migration to Kubernetes. Cool, awesome. Well, hey Mark, thank you again so much. Uh, you're gonna hang around with us for a little yes. bit, so. Uh, I think Thanks there's some more me. questions in the chat. If you want to pop over there and you can have some conversations with folks while you're there. And of course. Now we're going to queue up uh, David and Philip. Um, so they're going to be talking to us about .NET Aspire and Dapper. And Philip, I think you're going to share your screen. And All right, I will. Oh, Philip. There we go. Um, yeah, so hi, my name is Philip. Um, I'm a, a developer at Microsoft, been there for quite a while, mostly focused um, at my time there on, on Visual Studio and related tooling. Um, lately, I've been a part of the, the team that focuses on Dapper and other you know, cloud native tooling teams. Um, and today I wanna to talk a little bit about Dapper and .NET Aspire. So, um, so .NET Aspire was announced um, last fall at at um, MS Ignite um, .NET Conf, and there are a lot of questions about what Aspire meant to Dapper developers. Um, there's some confusion about what it meant because at first glance you might think there's that there's some overlap, and so which one should I use? Um, and the truth is, and we'll get into that a little bit in a little bit. Um, the truth is both, um, if you want, or neither if you want, uh, but hopefully both. Um, so, and, and I think part of the problem is that .NET Aspire is a very multifaceted um, technology. It's a, it's, it's a combination of different, um, different ideas in terms of being a, a, a um, opinionated, opinionated way of building um, primarily .NET based cloud native applications, but not necessarily only .NET based applications. And um, we can talk a little bit about that too. Um, and, I, and so we'll start just by describing a little bit more about .NET Aspire in general, and some of the different aspects of, of the, the technology. So sort of the primary piece or the, the main piece of .NET Aspire is building up this, pro, this object model or this application model um, that models your application services and dependencies. Um, so if you're familiar with, with Project Ty, it's a familiar concept where you're declaring, these are my services, these are how they are, um, these are how they arrange, these are their dependencies and so on. Um, in this case, whereas in Project Ty, you were using YAML, um, you're using uh, C Sharp um, uh, in, in, in .NET Aspire. And then that model can be used by both .NET Aspire itself, its runtime for orchestrating your application for local development, but it can also be um, that model could be published into a manifest and that manifest can then be used by other tools, for example, by say the, the Azure Dev CLI for taking that manifest and figuring out how to deploy your application to ACA. Uh, uh, so there's there's the, the application model aspect of it and then there's the orchestration model, um, which I think is one of the primary areas where .NET Aspire really shines with Dapper. Um, and that is, the Aspire runtime can start up your services and can spin up all of your dependencies. If you're familiar with Project Ty, it's doing something very similar, but in a, I would say, a much more powerful, flexible way. Um, so it can not only start your services, um, but it'll start all your databases, your storage emulators, and so on and so forth, in your random containers um, that you want to run. And not only can it just start them, but it can also help orchestrate the the flow of credentials and connection information between those services and dependencies, right? So I can start, um, if I need Azure storage, I can just start the Azure emulator using .NET Aspire and I don't have to worry about connection strings and making sure that I've got environment variables set so that um, so I can sw swap out between, you know, local storage emulator and like a real 
um, Azure Storage. Everything is just kind of connected and it all happens. I don't have to worry about passing port information from one application to the next application um, and, and statically declaring a bunch of, of, of static ports, which if you're familiar with doing Dapper, sort of hand um, orchestration by hand, that becomes a, a large pain point. Um, is making sure that the sidecars have all the same port information that the applications do and vice versa. Um, so another aspect of that in Aspire is that it sort of builds in its own sort of um, observability service, right? And it helps applications configure themselves so that they're automatically sending logs, traces, metrics to that central service so you can see it all in one place, even when you're developing locally. So you don't have to wait till you actually deploy um, to Azure or somewhere else to be able to understand whether or not you're really getting that, that information that you expect. And just having that traceability, even on your local machine is pretty helpful in understanding what your application is doing if you've got a handful of services that are all bouncing between each other. So .NET Aspire also has a notion of components and these are not the same thing as Dapper components. Um, these are not an abstraction layer, which we typically think of components for, for Dapper as. Um, but a wrapping of sort of the best practices around existing SDKs. Um, so things that automatically plug observability, logs, traces, metrics together, so that when you use them, you get all of the benefits of a, that observability without having to do all of that work yourself in, in terms of manually configuring each and every SDK that you might use. Um, so if you're using you know, the Azure Storage SDK, you're still using the Azure SDK, Storage SDK with .NET Aspire, but there are some helpful wrappers around that for making sure that you get all of the resiliency policies applied, all the observability policies applied sort of automatically without having to do a bunch of extra manual work. Um, and sort of the last aspect of .NET Aspire is sort of the tooling aspect where it's not just one thing, it's actually a collection of, of things. So there's everything from the .NET CLI itself, um, in terms of, of offering project templates that help you get started with .NET Aspire. There's obviously Visual Studio, uh, which offers debugging capability. Um, so being able to automatically attach the processes that are orchestrated by .NET Aspire to make debugging um, easier. To Azure Dev CLI, which allows, which can, can take that published manifest that, that describes your application um, in sort of a generic way and then apply that to say a deployment to ACA. Um, and in fact, the, with the latest version of .NET Aspire, you can actually do that with Dapper apps and make sure that when that app is deployed, Dapper is turned on, components are configured um, with some with some um, caveats, but we can talk about that. Um, and then there's third, it's .NET Aspire is, is readily extensible and flexible. Third parties can use that same information to do things like um, there's an um, Aspirate tool that will take that manifest and generate the Kubernetes deployment YAML that you might need to be able to take your application deployed to Kubernetes. Um, so that's kind of like in a nutshell, kind of generically what .NET Aspire is about. Um, so now I'll talk about maybe Dap Dapper specifically. And I mentioned before that there's early on, there's some confusion about if I'm a .NET developer, should I be using .NET Aspire or should I be using Dapper? And the truth is that they're complementary, right? They're not competitive. They're not intended to be. One doesn't have to win. Um, they're two just different, both valid perspectives on development of microservices and cloud native applications, right? And you can mix and match which aspects of each um, technology that you want to use, right? So you might decide that, no, you, you prefer the abstracted um, the abstracted service notion of Dapper in terms of being able to talk to any DB or any state store or pub sub or whatever, but still use .NET Aspire for doing all the orchestration um, of your application for when you want to just get everything up and running and debug, right? Uh, <clears throat> or you can choose, and this has happened in, in my case where I want to use Dapper to the extent that I can in terms of getting that sort of service agnostic layer. Um, but there are times when I have to go directly to say blob storage. And so I'm using those SDKs directly. In that case, maybe I would choose to use .NET Aspire wrapped components um, for talking to the, the storage um, through their native SDK while I use service invocation from Dapper, while I use pub sub um, components from Dapper, right? So there's really no reason why you can't use either. It's not all or one, all or nothing. You don't have to buy completely into either one. You can mix and match as, as desired. Um, so .NET Aspire shipped with the Dapper extension on day one um, last fall. That first preview 
um, really what's the basics of, of being able to start and configure those dapper sidecars um, automatically so that you didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to configure ports and, and, and make sure that the port information for the sidecar got to the, the application, the application's port got to the sidecar, all that's kind of wired for you. With Preview 2, we added a little bit, um, a little bit more uh, uh, features, one of which was trying to bring the notion of Dapper components to be sort of a first class .NET Aspire resource, um, like the sidecars, like projects, like other, other kinds of, of, of backend services. And then also adding some basic ACA deployment through the Azure Dev CLI. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll talk, we can talk a little bit about that. If you're using an IDE like Visual Studio, um, you now have just even more options than you did before. So there's the Dapper extension for, for VS, which offered similar features as for VS Code. Um, that was sort of allowing launch and debug through the use of Dapper run files for, that offers some consistency between you know, orchestrating your application on the command line versus VS Code and now VS, um, which for simple applications may be enough. Um, if you have a, a more complex, a larger orchestration, you need to spin up other, other um, dependencies. Um, .NET Aspire is sort of an, an alternative um, way of orchestrating your project and being able to launch everything, have the debugger automatically connected and debug that way. Whichever way works the best for you. Um, is fine. And then, of course, .NET Aspire doesn't require you to use any IDE at all. You can just do a .NET run on the app host and everything starts. You can you can um, then go and, and either manually attach the processes that are started or just use the, the Aspire dashboard to, um, to see your application as it runs and get information about each of the individual pieces. So, <clears throat> so now I want to just go and switch to a little bit of a demo. So this is the 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 Dapper Playground project in the .NET Aspire repo. It's a very basic project. It's two applications, Service A and Service B. Service A uses service invocation through Dapper to Service B, requests some data, um, gets data back, caches it using um, a Dapper state store, and Service B also, just for fun, publishes a message um, through Dapper PubSub that's then subscribed to by the first service. Um, so there's there's not a lot there. Um, um, and then you'll see we have a, a app host. This is the Aspire host. So Aspire is kind of built on the idea that you have another C-sharp based project in your solution that represents that orchestration project. It It's, it's the one that references all of the Aspire related hosting um, uh, .NET packages. Um, and then describes your application in C# -sharp code. Um, so it's a very familiar pattern if you're familiar with ASP.NET development. Um, you have a builder pattern where you add each of the individual um, service projects to it. Um, so you can see that adding the service A and service B. And then to add Dapper support, it's literally just just importing a uh, aspire.hosting.dapper NuGet package and then adding a with Dapper sidecar to each project. And that's all that's, ne that's needed in order to get your basic sidecar started. And of course, this, this method offers um, a variety of overloads for allowing you to customize app ID, um, app port, configuration paths, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so you have all of the flexibility of, of setting um, the various Dapper CLI um, command line arguments, um, but you don't have to if you don't need it. And we'll talk about the, the components uh, a little bit later, but so let's go ahead and let's just run this. As I mentioned before, I'm in VS Code. It's typically where I do most day-to-day -day stuff, um, but it works great for starting my applications uh, when I don't necessarily need to debug right away, but just want to get everything running. So it's going to run everything. It starts up my applications, hooks everything together, um, and then it starts up a very handy dashboard. And if you're familiar with Project Tie, um, it's similar, but way, way nicer. Um, so we can see a list of all of the, the, the running um, executables. Here are my projects that are running. Here are the Dapper sidecars they're running. Um, if we go to each one, we can see details about it, um, port information, 
endpoints, environment variables, so we can confirm that things got hooked up the way we expect. You can see here's all of the Dapper related um, environment variables been pushed. So if you're using the Dapper SDKs within your services, everything is, is connected. Um, there's no configuration. Everything is dynamic. You don't have to worry about, about port conflicts. You just run and things are hooked together. Um, so let's go ahead and go to our endpoint um, and we'll make a call. In fact, so there's our endpoint. We got back a response. We'll make a couple calls just for fun. And we can see that we got the same information back, which is good because as I mentioned, the, the way the app works is it caches that first response for a minute and then reuses that response later on. Um, and that cache is based on a Dapper state store. So one of the cool things about using .NET Aspire is because all of the telemetry and observability stuff is all sort of plumbed together and being reported to the Aspire runtime is now we can actually go back and look at traces of our application. So we see here's our first call to our service A. And you can see the different components involved. So we can actually get a complete view, including calls made through the Dapper sidecar. So we can see here's that initial call coming into service A. It is using service invoke, uh, or it's using PubSA or state store um, to try and see if that information has been cached. In this case, it hasn't been cached. So it actually has to go on and do a service invoke to the service B. You can see that's going through um, the, the Dapper sidecar as well. Um, service B is actually doing a publish event through Dapper using PubSub. Um, to publish messages saying, I was called. Um, so you can actually see the trace still continuing through uh, the Dapper sidecar for making that um, pub sub request and actually being picked up again by service A, which has subscribed to that. So you can see everything sort of full circle all together. And then finally, you can see where service A is now actually using the state store and Dapper to cache the request. So we go back to our traces. We can see on subsequent requests are much simpler. They don't involve um, service B at all, because it was able to just fetch that data direct from the state store. And you can see that, and it was returning that data. So no other calls were necessary. So it's very easy to get a real sense of what your application is doing um, across multiple um, invocations um, throughout the entire uh, mesh of, of your, your application. And of course, you can also go and look at individual logs. So we can look at, say, if we're, there's issues or we just want to verify something, we can look at the sidecar logs. All the logs are sort of um, um, aggregated together um, in one place. So I can see my application logs, Dapper sidecar logs, and so on. And then there's also uh, metrics are being returned by the various services. We'll go to that one. So we can get all sorts of, of handy metrics for understanding um, how our application performs all in one place. We didn't have to deploy anything. Um, else we didn't have to deploy it to the cloud in order to make use of the clouds, observability layers, everything just kind of built together. All right. Um, so we did that. So let's go ahead and say, we'll stop. Um, and we'll, we'll start the same project, um, in visual studio. So same exact project, but now we want to use visual studio sort of debugging, um, debugging help with Aspire. So we've made this app host, the startup project. We can go ahead and just um, F5. It's going to do the same thing, build the project, run it, but then it's automatically going to attach to all the processes um, that's been spun up. So in a moment, there's a spire running. We started to attach to various things. All right, and here's our dashboard again. Here we can go back to our service A endpoint. So let's go ahead and execute. Now we've hit a breakpoint in service A. We can let it continue. Now we hit a breakpoint in service B um, because it's that first call. Um, we can step through it in the debugger, do all the debugging Visual Studio stuff that we want to do. Um, and if we run it again here, we're back in service A. But if we continue again, because things are being cached, now we don't hit our breakpoint in service B, which is what we would expect to happen. Um, so everything seems to be working great. And so we can see with using the same project, the same Aspire host, we can we can do similar things both outside of an IDE or in VS Code as well as in VS. VS adds some debugging aspects um, that are nice um, if you're a Visual Studio user. But again, you can attach manually even if you're in VS Code once things are running. Um, I do that all the time. Um, and those are kind of the two 
parts of, of, of the demo that I have today. Um, so one thing I wanted to go back to was talking a little bit about um, some of the features that are newer to Dapper and .NET Aspire, and that's the concept of, of components as first class sort of citizens in the, the .NET Aspire world. Um, so one of the things that um, we had wanted to do was make it a little bit easier to configure um, Dapper applications. Um, so as I mentioned before, this application makes use of state store and pub sub. Um, we don't really care what kind of state store or what kind of pub sub. Ordinarily, when you've installed Dapper, um, there's sort of this ambient um, uh, pub sub and state store components that are that are registered, and they're based on on Redis um, components that are that are spun up by by Dapper during initialization. But not every environment has that. Um, for example, if I'm running, um, if I'm doing some development on Windows in ARM64, I don't have the ability to, to use Docker. And so I don't have the ability to spin up a Redis container if I want PubSub or state store. But I can use the in-memory Dapper components, which is nice. My application doesn't have to change. I just need to change the way that I orchestrate my application. And um, Dynet Aspire lets me do that um, by explicitly declaring that I need a state store and a pub sub Dapper component, and in particular, which projects require which components. And in so doing, if I'm running on an application, if I'm running on a system that has Dapper fully initialized, that has a Dapper Redis component, um, and that's as, and I don't need a completely custom state store or pub sub, the .NET Aspire runtime will automatically use that one and will configure each sidecar to use that ambient um, that ambient component. But as I mentioned before, if I'm running on Windows ARM64 and can't run Docker, um, if I run that same .NET Aspire project without any changes, .NET Aspire will recognize that those components don't exist and will automatically, will automatically scaffold configuration, um, Dapper configuration for the in-memory components. And so the application starts, the application is happy because they get um, a, a Dapper provided state store and pub sub. Um, there are some caveats to that in terms of like the in memory ones don't necessarily work between, in, in particular, pub sub doesn't necessarily work between applications, um, but the state stores does, um, which which works well. So, um, so that gets used also for ACA deployment, where if I take this application and use the Azure Dev CLI to deploy it to, to ACA, then because I'm I'm ex being explicit about which components um, each project are used by each project, um, the the CLI will make sure to scaffold um, specific configuration files um, for each application um, in ACA, as well as actually tell ACA to spin up um, a Redis uh, DB as part of the the ACA environment, um, so that the application is still, even when it's running in a completely different place, it still has access to a, a Dapper-based state store, a Dapper-based pub sub, and no configuration needed to be done. Um, no alterations to the project needed to be done. Um, I didn't show that here um, just because deployment takes a little bit too long for the purposes of demo, um, but it can be done, um, at least for, for fairly basic um, for uh, Dapper applications. And of course, Going forward, um, one of the things that we'd like to do is, is sort of iterate and improve on and, and add additional support for, or more broad support for Java components in .NET Aspire. Um, so that was a long-winded way and we're running up on time. So um, are there any questions at this point? I asked yeah. a bunch in a chat, um, but there's okay. some more. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, one question is Aspire is .NET specific. Does Microsoft plan to implement Aspire in other languages like Java? Um, that's a good question for David. Uh, um, no. I mean, so at least <laughs> right now, there, there's definitely no plan to, to write this thing in Java. Um, there is interest in orchestrating more than .NET from .NET, so you're, you still have a, the app host in C Sharp, and you can orchestrate Node, Python, um, .NET projects. You can run anything that you want 
It's just we kind of hoisted first class support for Node and um, .NET projects. But the way those work is under the covers, those are both executables. We just happen to understand more about those two kinds of projects. But this thing is, is essentially an orchestrator of both containers and projects. And it, and it, does, it does networking between the host and um, containers as well. So it kind of does compose, but on steroids, right? Um, and then it, the way Buffer plugs in is actually pretty cool. It can kind of, you can plug it into the system because it is all C sharp and just like code that runs where we have different hooks as to when things happen in the system. So like before running, before we get the addresses and Dapper can basically automatically inject sidecar information and inject an executable that boots the sidecar locally. And if you think about the mental model for how Dapper plugs into Kubernetes, the same thing, right? You you add a CRD that has a sidecar in injection hook, and whenever a pod gets created, if it has the right um, annotation, then the sidecar injector will like add the sidecar. This is the the moral equivalent, but for local dev, so you don't have to configure every sidecar passing in the port and the app name. Just calling with Dapper sidecar is the way you kind of mark um, to say, I want this um, resource to have a sidecar. And then there's code that runs where Dapper just says, okay, I'm going to find all the, the resources, find the thing that says, give me a sidecar, and then inject it on the fly. So you get that same effect of like magic um, Dapper configuration without having to manually just like wire up things. Hey, David. And hey, Ron. Hey. Hey. Hey, Ron. Um, Love yeah, Tennessee. <laughs> Um, no, this is all really great stuff. I'm just building on the previous question. You know, this is amazing, but can you rewrite it in Go? <laughs> hey, hey, you know, I had to, I, I had the, to. The, the, sincere, the sincerest form of flattery is imitation. So I, I would love if, like, we just took this thing and copied it into every language. I, I, that made me happy. It's like Pulumi, yeah. but for local dev, right? Yeah. One sure. of the one of the nice things about .NET Aspire is that it has a very flexible sort of extensibility model. Um, there's a bunch of different layers. There's a bunch of different hooks. Um, the Dapper support for .NET Aspire is a completely separate assembly. It's not built in um, or tightly coupled with Aspire itself. So anything, everything that we've done with, with the Dapper support in .NET Aspire, you can do yourself, right? You could write your own extensibility to do things in a similar way or a different way or get whatever level of customization out of it that you want. It is rather flexible. So there, there's definitely ways that you could adapt um, that base hosting model to use it for other purposes, other platforms and, and so on. And so, and we're seeing that um, over time as, as people start playing with .NET Aspire with other development stacks. Yeah, no, this is great. And uh, just to be fair, there are similar tools in the Go ecosystem, but this honestly looks better than what I know. Nice. Good to know. Nice. All right, folks, let's do, let's do one more question real quick. Um, if anyone has anything they want to ask, and then we're going to we're gonna move forward and, and wrap up with like some of the community updates. Going once, going twice. Just Anything one more question. Else? about Project Tai uses .NET for YAML instead of YAML. Is it like Project Tai uses .NET instead of YAML and can do more? Yeah, so one of the big changes that we made, like if, if you look at what Aspire is today, there were a lot of things that we took from Tai that we learned while doing Tai that got that came into Aspire. And one of the initial like discussions we had was, do we keep the YAML or do we move the code? And there was a long set of discussion like back and forth, like do we want to have code? One of the big, big things that you know people asked for in Thai was how do I extend the model? And we had extensions in Thai that were like I think for Dapper and for um the Elk stack. But the issue with those was you had to send the pull request to the Thai source code to to mutate and add extensions. And trying to build a model where you plug in extensions via like a config system and you have to kind of bring code in it gets complex really fast as you have to rebuild the package manager and, and that entire uh, system. So if you take advantage of what a language already has, you can take a component, a resource, put it in, put it in, put it in a NuGet package, put it on NuGet. So you kind of get versioning, distribution. You're, you're taking advantage of all the things that that, that code can do. So that, that's kind of how we ended up with this, like instead of YAML having code. Um, and it, I think so far it's been paying off. Nice. So David, really quick, if folks want to get involved and continue these conversations around 
Aspire and some of this microservice stuff that you guys are working on? Like, what's a good place for them to go? Yeah, so go to GitHub slash .NET slash Aspire. Okay. Um, that is where everything's happening. We're currently like on the road to shipping our first version. So there's a, a lot of lockdown and like ha I'm, I'm happening. We're scoping everything. So yeah, it's going pretty well. All right, awesome. Well, hey, thank you all so much. Um, and then just also just to remember, there is a .NET channel inside of the Dapper Discord repo. Yeah. So I think Philip, I think Philip is in there sporadically. So if folks want to go in there and have conversations about these things, that's also a place that that can happen as well. All right, so let's move forward. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again super quick, and uh, let's go through some of the community updates. Now, if you haven't heard yet, um, happening on February 21st, so that's this month, we are having Dapper Day. Now, that's going to be really exciting. We have tons of conversations from folks around the community. Um, there's going to be talks on running Dapper in production, on doing testing with Dapper. I think there's even a conversation, a talk about Dapper and um, .NET Aspire. So if folks want to learn more about like what's happening there, make sure you go ahead and like, you know, you can scan the QR code or go to that bit.ly link and you can learn a little bit more about uh, Dapper Day. Um, also now I want to run through some of the really interesting posts and, and content that folks have been creating in the Dapper community. So this one here, uh, super quick talking about like Dapper PubSub over gRPC. So, so Dan put this post together talking about his experience not using HTTP for PubSub, but using gRPC. So if you're interested in learning about that, make sure you go ahead and, and check this one out. Uh, over on the Diagrid YouTube channel, um, there was this uh, webinar talking about Dapper as the ultimate microservice patterns framework. And this was done by Billigen. Uh, I think it's about, yeah, this is about an hour or so, but really great conversation talking about like some of those different patterns and practices that you could use inside of Dapper. Um, and then Mark, our friend Mark, uh, Mark's another one of our community managers here, wrote this blog post fairly recently um, talking about building a distributed pizza store in .NET with serverless Dapper APIs. So again, if you wanted to have a conversation and, and see what it means to, to use serverless Dapper, uh, definitely make sure you check that out. And last but not least, uh, there's another video on YouTube that recently came out from the Azure Community Enthusiast. This one's on February 5th. Um, this is a two-part conversation. The first one talking about, you know, using the different components of Dapper. And then the second part, um, there was Will. Will was here talking about using Radius, which is, I think, is another CNCF, uh, you know, cloud-native um, project that we have that we could take a look at. But with that being said, um, I'm going to put all these links inside of our Discord channel, and um, we'll put them in the show notes once the video gets published to YouTube. So definitely make sure you check those out. And then um, also want to encourage everyone to join the Discord channel. I mentioned it a little while before, but it's not just for .NET folks, <laughs> everyone. We have a channel for all of the different SDKs, um, the different uh, building blocks and all those types of things inside of there. So make sure you head over there and uh, tell us what you're building. Let us know what you're working on, having those questions answered for you. Uh, we have badges and stuff for the community that you could check out. And last but not least, um, I don't know if we have time for open discussion today. We're a little bit over time. Uh, maybe we can have the open discussion inside of the Discord channel. Let's do that. And you know we'll respect folks' time and let them go. But I want to thank everyone for showing up today for this uh, today's Dapper community call. Um, we're going to schedule the other one pretty soon. So definitely looking forward for you all joining us. And thank you to our speakers. You know, Appreciate it, David, Mark, Philip. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, you know, feel free to reach out to them on social media or whatever the case is and, you know, continue those conversations. All right, folks, thank you so much. And I'll see you later. Thanks, everyone.